Hey, let's turn in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. And the title of my message today is Hot Button Issues. Hey, you want to know what the non-believer's favorite verse is? First of all, let me tell you what it isn't. It's not John 3.16. There was a time when just about everybody could recite John 3.16, perhaps along with the Lord's Prayer uh, or Psalm 23 from memory. No longer. Most people don't know John 3.16. The favorite verse of non-believers is Matthew 7.1. I doubt that they even know what the reference is, but they like what it says. And they'll usually say it after you say something like, well, you know what? I don't think that's right. Now here's their favorite verse. Who are you to judge me? Doesn't the Bible say, judge not lest you be judged? How many of you have heard that before? And you think, well, what do you say to that? Well, wait a second. Understand that that verse is not telling you you should not make judgments. Because in other passages we read that we as believers are indeed to make evaluations, to be discerning, and yes, to make judgments. In fact, the Scripture even asks the question, are saints not worthy to judge even the smallest Matters, And the Bible also tells us judgment begins in the house of God. We are to judge, but we're not to condemn. And that's, by the way, really a better translation of that verse would be condemn not lest you be condemned. I'm in no position to condemn a person, but I am in a position to make judgments about things, about situations, about viewpoints, and even about people to some degree. Judge not lest you be judged. This is said by people who don't like it when we dare to have a world view. I find the most narrow-minded people around are the ones who claim to be the most broad-minded. Don't you? Those who claim to be the most accepting are often the most unaccepting. Because when a Christian has an opinion on something, the non-believer will say, well, how dare you say that? Who are you to make that evaluation or that judgment? For instance, here's something we hear a lot from non-believers. All religions essentially teach the same thing. Right? How many of you have heard that before? Let me just say, anyone who says that doesn't know anything about the great religions of the world today, because if one thing is clear, it is this, they do not teach the same thing. And this has been illustrated quite effectively in the news in the last couple of days. We all know about what happened to Tiger Woods. And he offered what has been described as his mea culpa in a press conference that he held. And he acknowledged his infidelities and he accepted responsibility for what he had done. And he said in this Uh, statement he made, and I quote, that he had actively practiced his faith from childhood, but obviously had lost track of what he was taught. And that faith, Tiger reveals, is Buddhism. Tiger was raised as a Buddhist, you see. And he is saying, I've strayed from my faith, but I'm going to get back to it now. Well, here's the problem with Buddhism, is they do not believe in a personal God that is there to forgive a person. Now you make a statement like that. Buddhists do not believe that there is a personal God who will forgive people and some people will jump right down your throat and say, well how insensitive and unkind of you to say that. Who are you to say that about Buddhists? Wait a second. That's not me. That's not unkind. That's what Buddhists say about themselves. In fact, after Tiger made this statement, a Buddhist leader in New York City said, quote, Buddhists do not believe in a personal God and there is no one to forgive you. There you have it from, well, a Buddhist. A director of of a meditation center in New York City said, quote, if redemption is defined as being forgiven by a God that is outside of ourselves, Buddhists don't believe in a God that's outside of ourselves. So I bring this up to point out how absurd it is when people say all religions teach the same thing. Well, Christianity and Buddhism certainly don't. Buddhism says there is no personal God there to forgive you. Christianity says there is a personal God there to forgive you who sent his son to die on the cross and pay the price for your sin so you can indeed be forgiven. Uh, A Boston University professor on Buddhism told the press 
after Tiger Woods made his confession, quote, you have the law of karma, and no matter what Woods says or does, he is going to have to pay for whatever wrongs he's done. There's no accountant in the sky wiping sins off your balance sheet like there is in Christianity, end quote. Accountant in the sky? Well, that's not exactly how I would describe God, but yet he had one part of it right. There is in Christianity the offer of the removal of sins indeed. Commentator Britt Humes had the audacity to suggest that what Tiger Woods really needed was a relationship with Jesus Christ. And this was considered very controversial. In a roundtable discussion with other news people, Britt Hume said of Tiger, he said he's a Buddhist. I don't think that faith offers the kind of forgiveness and redemption that's offered by the Christian faith. So my advice to Tiger would be, Tiger, turn to the Christian faith and you can make a total recovery and be a great example to the world. End quote. That's called a Christian worldview. That is a believer who has obviously seen things through a biblical lens. Well, uh, as Britt Hume said it, you go ahead and see what happens. Say the name of Jesus and all hell will break loose. And indeed it did among his peers and columnists and others. In fact, one commentator said of that statement by Britt Hume, the fact that a journalist, and I use that term loosely as it pertains to Hume, would go on a national news show and put down another high-profile individual's faith should tell us all that religious bigotry and bigotry as a whole is a growing problem in this country. Religious bigotry? Why is it bigoted to express an opinion about your faith? Actually, what he said about Buddhism was accurate. What he said about Christianity was also accurate. But yet, because he dared to express an opinion, he is called a bigot. This is the kind of culture we're living in today. Where if you dare to say something is right or wrong, you are labeled intolerant, bigoted, uh, hateful, a hater. So with that backdrop in mind, let's deal with some of the most controversial topics in our culture today. We could identify them as hot button issues. Abortion, capital punishment, homosexuality, self-defense, and the use of force. Now, before we deal with these topics, I'm going to ask a favor of you, and that is that you respond biblically and logically, not emotionally. Because sometimes when you say the things that I'm about to say, uh, some will have a knee-jerk reaction and they'll say something along the lines of, well, my God would never do thus and so. And remember, in our study in the Ten Commandments, we've already realized that when we come up with, quote, our God, which is really our self that we're worshiping, it's not a God at all, but it's having another God before him, you see. So let's just see what the Bible says on these topics so we can think about them properly. Because that's what this series is called, Worldview. Because worldview is how we see life around us. And we want a biblical worldview. Everyone has a worldview. Everyone believes something. Even those that say they don't believe anything actually believe something. The question is, is your worldview biblical or isn't it? What is a biblical worldview? It's been defined by John MacArthur in his book, Think Biblically, as, uh, as this. Quote, the first will be, it's based on two major presuppositions. The first will be the eternal existence of the personal, transcendent, triune, creator God. Second, the God of Scripture has revealed his character, purposes, and will in the infallible and inerrant pages of his special revelation, the Bible which is superior to any other source of revelation or human reason alone. Simplified, there is a living God and he has revealed himself in the pages of Scripture. Therefore, we as believers accept the fact that we have absolute truth from God. We develop our Christian worldview from what the Bible teaches, period. The objective is not to conform the Bible to the changing culture, but to change or conform the changing culture to what the Bible teaches. So let's deal with some of these issues. Capital punishment. 
self-defense? Is it ever justified? What about homosexuality? Why is it wrong? And is it possible that a person is born that way? What about the family? What is it? What isn't it? And then we'll talk also about abortion. Are you awake yet? <laughs> Fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> We're looking at the Ten Commandments. Remember they're divided into two groups of four and six, not as some would think five and five. The first four have to do with my relationship with God. The final six have to do with my relationship with people. The first four commandments we've already looked at together. Commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before him. Commandment number two, you shall have no graven images. Commandment number three, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. And finally, commandment number four, you shall keep the Sabbath day. Now we come to commandment number four. 5, verse 12, Exodus 20, honor your father and your mother. Honor your father and your mother. And all the parents said, amen. <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> Before a word is spoken about how to treat others, God starts with a family. I don't think anything can bring greater pleasure than our family. Few things can give us as much pain as our families. Kids have problems with parents. Parents have problems with kids. Sometimes people will say, well, man, I came from a dysfunctional family. Yeah, welcome to the club. Welcome to humanity. My question is, who doesn't have a dysfunctional family? I came from a dysfunctional family, and I am the head of a dysfunctional family. <laughs> and let me add one other thing. My wife and I, who have been married 36 years, have irreconcilable differences. Thank you for your applause. <laughs> we have irreconcilable differences. She's neat and I'm messy. She's sometimes late and I am usually early. She's cute and I'm fat. <laughs> These are irreconcilable. Why? Because she just gets cuter and I keep getting fatter. Now that's not something we would ever dissolve our marriage over. I'm just pointing out everybody is dysfunctional. Everybody has irreconcilable differences. I'm tired of these statements being used to excuse people who disregard what the Bible says. The family is so important. Our very existence as a society depends on the success of the family. Maybe that's why Satan hates it so much and tries to undermine and destroy it. It's been said, a family can survive without a nation, but a nation cannot survive without the family. And yet there's such an attack today on the family. In fact, the Bible tells us that one of the signs of the last days would be a breakdown in the family and a disrespect for parents in particular. 1 Timothy 3, 2 says, Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Here's God's word for a culture. Here's God's word for a society. Here's God's word for us. Honor your father and mother. Notice it says, honor your father and your mother. It does not say, honor your father and your father. <laughs> or honor your mother and your other mother. <laughs> or honor your mother and her live-in lover. Or her partner or whatever. We temper with God's template at our own peril. Of course, there's a movement afoot to redefine marriage and family today. Media and modern culture are pushing for same-sex marriage. The normalization of homosexuality is gaining momentum and movement today. And by the way, let me add this. This is not merely a political issue, friends. This is a moral issue. This is a biblical issue, okay? Don't say, well, you know, I have my politics and you have your... No, no, well, I don't know what your politics are. I don't really even care about your politics that much. But I'll tell you this much. This is a clear-cut issue in Scripture. And you're either going to think about it biblically or you're not going to think about it biblically. But the Bible is very clear on this topic that homosexuality is, God, is not in God's order. It isn't. In the Garden of Eden, he brought a man and a woman together. It was Adam and Eve. Not Adam and Steve. God is not anti-gay. 
God is anti-sin no matter how it is expressed. And he loves all people and wants them to come to repentance. And someone will say, well, you're homophobic to say that. I hate homophobic. I think I hate anything phobic. You know, you speak out on anything and you're something phobic. You know, you're critical of alcoholics. You're a drunkophobic. You speak out against cats, you're a cataphobic. <laughs> well, you speak out against what I'm saying from Scripture, so you're a Bible-aphobic. So there. <laughs> or a Christophobic. Listen, I'm a sinophobic. No matter how sin expresses itself, God deals with it. Let me make a statement that some will not agree with, but they're wrong. Okay, here it is. I know I'll get letters. <laughs> Greg at harvest.org. That's email me. You ready? Here's the statement. You're not born gay and alcoholism is not a disease. That's so insensitive. That's so mean. That's so harsh. That's so judgmental. That's so biblical. Why do I say that? You're not born gay. No, you're not. You're born a sinner. And I will acknowledge that as a person who is born with a sinful nature, you might be attracted to members of the same sex. Certainly that can happen. And I would also acknowledge that as a person who is born a sinner, you might be more prone to issues of addiction. Some people, if they touch alcohol or get involved in drugs, they become addicts, okay? Uh, so there are certain people that are perhaps more vulnerable in those areas. But having said that, all of these things can be overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've met people who are addicts who no longer are and are now under the control of the Holy Spirit. I've met people who are homosexuals that are now living a heterosexual lifestyle. If you're born gay, how do you stop being gay if you were born that way? Answer, you weren't born that way. You were born a sinner in need of a Savior who can change you and help you to live the life He has called you to live. That's the answer. But in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, it says, Don't you know that those who do wrong will have no share in the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or idol worshipers, we've dealt with that already, adulterers, prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, abusers, swindlers, none of these will have a share in the kingdom of God. Listen, the Bible does not give a confused statement on this topic. There's no confusion on the issue unless your confusion is with the Bible. Romans chapter 1 verses 22 to 27 lay it out as plainly as it could be laid out what the Bible teaches on this topic. God's order is for the family to be a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, faithful to each other. We need to respect that and give it the honor that it deserves. How I thank God for the couples that have stayed together and raised their children in the way of the Lord. If you came from a family where mom and dad stayed together and raised you as a Christian, you need to really thank them. I remember when I was a kid growing up, I came from a divorced home and we moved around a lot and people would soon find out I didn't have a dad. And that was considered scandalous back in the 20s. <laughs> well, I'm not that old. Actually, the 50s and early 60s, oh, your mom's divorced, whoa. You don't have a dad. Now it's considered curious if you have a mom and a dad together. Your mom and dad are together and you live with both of them? What's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, someone will ask me sometimes when I'm with my wife, well, how long have you been married? We'll say 36 years. It's like their jaw drops to the ground. For starters, my wife looks like she's 36. And then secondly, they notice how fat I am. Second reference to that. <laughs> oh, I have a third reference for it, actually, because the word Hebrew for honor, your father and mother, means to be heavy or to give way. See, that's what it's all about. No, but it doesn't mean it that way. What it means is there, this is a weighty thing to be a parent. You know, to put it in 60s vernacular, this is heavy, dude. 
Now really, there's a lot of responsibility that goes with being a parent. Honor your mom and dad. Give them the recognition they deserve for their God-given authority, respect and esteem and value, and prize them as gifts from God. Even when they say that one thing that every kid hates to hear from their parents. Mom, why can't I go and do that and so? Because I told you so. Oh, but why? Because I said so. Oh, I hate that. Yeah, you watch. One day you'll be saying it too. <laughs> it makes me laugh when people talk about raising kids who have a, a one-year-old or a two-year-old. I love to see them dispensing parental advice. You know what my advice to you is? Shut up. <laughs> you don't even talk to me until you had a teenager and have lived to tell the story. And you'll understand the advice of Mark Twain who said this about raising a teen. Quote, things run along pretty smoothly until your kid reaches 13. That's the time you need to stick him in a barrel. <laughs> Hammer the lid down nice and snug and feed him through the knot hole. <laughs> then he adds, when they turn 16, plug up the knot hole. That's, <laughs> that's right. Okay, kids, listen up. You are to honor and obey your parents. That's what the Bible says, Colossians 3, 20 to 21. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Or as the Phillips translation puts it, and you children, your duty is to obey your parents, for at your age, this is one of the best things you can do to show your love for God. This is hard, though, because sometimes kids will look at their parents and think that they don't know what they're talking about. How could you say that to me? Why won't you let me do this thing? What's wrong with you? Again, to quote Mark Twain, he said, quote, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much he had learned in seven years. <laughs> Reminds me of a, a magazine article I read years ago that describes how a child sees their parents as the years pass. And this is specifically about dad. At four years old, the child says, my daddy can do anything. At seven, they say, my daddy knows a lot, a whole lot. At eight, they say, my father doesn't know quite everything. At 12, oh well, naturally my dad doesn't know about that either. At 14, dad is so out of date. 21, dad is so lame. 25. Dad knows a little bit about it, but not too much. Age 30, let's find out what Dad thinks about that. <laughs> Age 35, well, before we decide, let's get Dad's idea first. At 50, I wonder what my dad would have thought about that. And at 60, at 60, you know what? My dad knew literally everything. You might ask the question, what about if my parents are not Christians, should I still honor them? The answer is yes, you should. Honor your father and mother. In fact, that may be the way that you win them to the Lord. Listen to this. The hardest people to reach are members of your own family. Your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your extended family as well. Listen, even Jesus did not reach his whole family before his death and resurrection. And who was a better example than Jesus Christ? He never did anything wrong. Can you imagine being one of Jesus' siblings? And having Mary lecture you, why can't you be more like Jesus? <laughs> look, look at how your brother behaves. Look at how respectful he is. Look at how hard he works. Be more like Jesus. But mommy's like, perfect. I want you to ask yourself a question, young man, when you make, before you make a decision, you ask yourself this, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Here's a little bracelet to wear. Mom, I don't want to wear it. <laughs> WWJD, no, Mom. <laughs> Jesus was perfect. But yet it wasn't until he died and resurrected that his mother believed. Yeah, so if you have non-believing parents, obey them. Well, what if they tell me to do something that's a sin before God? Like what? Making your bed? <laughs> cleaning up your room? Taking out the trash? Doing your chores? Doing your homework? Now, needless to say, if your parents would ask you to do something that is unbiblical, you are not required to do that. If your parents 
were to say, you cannot believe in Jesus Christ, it's okay under those circumstances to disobey them. Because sometimes one law supersedes another. It's like when the apostles were told it was illegal to preach the gospel. They said, well, sorry guys, but we must obey God and not man. So God is your ultimate authority, but under, uh, but under other circumstances, obey your parents and honor them as much as you can. Because guess what? One day you'll get a little bit older and you'll get married and you'll have kids and you'll find yourself saying the things you promised you would never say. You'll find yourself saying to your child before you can catch yourself, what, do you think I have a money tree somewhere? <laughs> oh, I see. If all your friends jumped off a cliff, would you jump off too? I can't believe I just said that. My mom used to say that to me. My dad used to say that. You know, we didn't have it so easy when I was a kid. Oh, no. Yeah. But what a joy it is when parents see their children walk with the Lord. As we're told over in 1 John, I have no greater joy to know than my children walk in truth. Commandment number 6, verse 13. You shall not kill. You shall not kill. Now we live in such a violent and murderous culture today. It's a wash in violence and killing. Over two million people a year become violent crime victims. But listen, a better translation of this verse would be, thou shall not murder. Murder would be the better translation of the word instead of kill. This commandment obviously forbids the taking of another human life for no justifiable reason. Time doesn't allow me to go into it, but suffice it to say that the Bible does not condemn all killing. A careful reading of Numbers 35 reveals that there's a difference between killing and murder. Now all murder, of course, is killing, but not all killing is necessarily murder. There are times when death is permissible, though not desirable. Say, like, when? How about self-defense? How about if someone breaks in your house with the intent of killing you and your family? Do you have a right to defend yourself? Are you just going to stand there and say, oh, praise the Lord? <laughs> yeah, I'll say, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's not scriptural, isn't it? When Jesus sent his disciples out, to preach the gospel, he told them to take a sword. Why should they take a sword? For shish kebab? <laughs> you defend yourself with a sword. That's why they had every right to defend themselves, as do you. Self-defense. When we were struck by these murderous terrorists who attacked us, that's justifiable. When we try to stop people who are bent on taking innocent lives, that is justifiable. Someone will say, oh no man, that's wrong because all killing is sin and if we kill them, then we're just as bad as they are. That's so stupid to say that. You know you call that moral equivalency. Well, all killing is wrong. Not necessarily, you see. Let me ask you this. Was the United States wrong to stop the Nazis from eradicating the Jewish people from the face of the planet in World War II? Was that a just cause? Yes, it was. There are times when war, it's not desirable, but we have to do what we have to do to defend human life. God has established laws to govern a culture by, and those that break those laws will face repercussions, and they know it. God has even established the police and the military, according to Scripture, Romans 13 says, the authorities do not frighten people who are doing right, but they frighten people who are doing wrong. So do what they say and you'll get along well. The authorities are sent by God to help you. But if you're doing something wrong, of course you should be afraid, for you'll be punished. The authorities are established by God for that very purpose, to punish those who do wrong. You know, when you're breaking the law, you hate cops. And you're paranoid every time you see it go, oh, it's the man, the man, <laughs> the man, the fuzz, the pigs, the heat. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, the meeting, when you're driving along, whoa, slow down, THP, slow down. Why do you slow down? Going too fast, that's why. Now see, if you're doing right, you don't have to worry about, hey, it's a police officer. I, I'm not saying wave at him. You don't want him to come in. Oh, you want a ticket? No, they wouldn't do that. But. <laughs> Be respectful. 
of what they're doing. And it's, I've, I've spent a lot of time with police officers. I'm a chaplain with the police department. I've done ride-alongs uh, with them on a number of occasions. I, I've, I, you know, and then just, it's funny when you just go out in a public place with a cop in uniform, how people react. You know, it's just, you walk into a coffee shop and there's a cop, you know, he's got the badge, he's got the mace, he's got the gun, he's got the donut. All the cops are like, yeah. I've been placed here by God. You better shut up. I'll cuff you. Now, so it's amazing how people react, though. They, they're just sitting there drinking. Oh, you know, and they're, they're, they're looking. Why? Because he represents the law. He's been placed there by God, as has the military. Does that mean that everything a police officer does, that the military does, is always right? No. But does that mean that... These are institutions established by the Lord himself. The answer is yes. But wait, what does it mean to not murder? The word murder could be translated to dash in pieces. Understand this. The word that is used here for thou shalt not murder, in Exodus 20, never describes the death of an animal. Nor does it describe the death of an opponent in war. Nor does it describe the death of capital punishment. And by the way, you may disagree with me on this, but I'll state my position. I believe in capital punishment. And I believe the Bible teaches it. There are good people on both sides of this debate. So uh, I would not say a person's not a believer if they disagree with me in this position. I, I respect someone who sees it differently, but I personally believe the Bible teaches capital punishment. Uh, Genesis 9, 6 says, you must execute anyone who murders another person, for to kill a person is to kill a living being made in God's image. Now, we're assuming, of course, that that person would be guilty beyond any doubt whatsoever before they were sent to be executed. But the ironic thing is often you will see those people having their vigil, their candlelight vigil for the person who murdered a family or, or murdered a child or, or did some horrible crime deserving of capital punishment and, and they'll be praying and they'll be holding up signs that say, thou shall not kill. And I'm like, well, but that's not what it means. It's thou shall not murder. That's the person that murdered in there. Here's the funny thing. I've met people that are against capital punishment, but they support abortion. That makes no sense to me. So effectively, they want to destroy the innocent and spare the guilty. See, I want to spare the innocent, the preborn child, and punish those that are guilty of a penalty like that. And let's deal with that topic now. Abortion. Sometimes people say, well, this is a controversial topic. Is it? Controversial among whom? Uh, anytime anyone says there's a lot of controversy among theologians, I've heard this said, I won't say who said it, but someone, well, now I'm getting that, but it doesn't matter really, but so many have said it, but they, they said, well, you know, even theologians debate when life begins. Really, what theologians are those? I really don't know many theologians that debate when life begins. Now, if a theologian believes in the Bible, I know what they'll believe and what they'll say. If they don't believe in the Bible, then I'm sure they'll come up with something else. But let me say, the Bible does not give an unclear word on the topic of when life begins. Life begins at conception. Not at birth, it begins at conception. This is... Absolute. Listen to David's words as he spoke of being in the womb. Psalm 139, verse 13. You made all of my delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Showing that God has a plan for each of us even before birth. God says in Jeremiah 1.5, I knew you and formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you. Notice that God says, I formed you in your mother's womb. Each child is created by God and should be given a chance to live. 
God does not say, I waited until you were born to have a plan for you because you're not a human yet. You're just a mass of tissue. No, God had a plan before the child was out of the womb. Max Lucado said, and I quote, you were deliberately planned, specifically gifted, and lovingly positioned on this earth by the master craftsman, end quote. You see, I was conceived out of wedlock. I wasn't planned. I wasn't meant to be. I'm so glad my mom didn't get an abortion as she easily could have done. But I was brought to term and allowed to live my life. Every child has a right to live. What about the mother's right? The mother's right is to protect the child. There are no illegitimate children. Every child is legitimate in the eyes of God, no matter how they were conceived. <laughs> Despite this, abortion is effectively used by many as a form of birth control. In the passing of Roe v. Wade, in the early 70s, 50 million babies had been aborted. I wonder if one of those babies would have grown up to find the cure for cancer. Or if one of those babies would have been the President of the United States. Or one of those babies would have been a great preacher. Or one of those babies would have done something to help our world. But we'll never know because they were silent, stopped. Abortion has grown into a $500 million a year industry in the U.S. And it takes in $10 billion worldwide. And here's something that is rarely discussed. When girls get abortion, and many of them get repeated, they go back again and again uh, for abortions later on. Uh, they experience a much higher depression rate than other girls and attempt suicide far more often than those who did not get an abortion. It's not the answer. If you've conceived a child and it's possible, marry the father and raise the child. If you can't do that, then raise the child as a single mother. If you can't do that, then carry the child to term and give it up for adoption. Abortion is never the answer. But we'll find ways to describe a preborn baby. We'll call them fetuses. Embryos, globs of cells, uterine contents, products of conception, and my favorite, this is a phrase that is actually used, not trying to be humorous, potential human beings. Oh, really? What else would they become? Potential human beings. Well, they might turn into a horse, you never know. <laughs> no. It's a human being, a pre-born human being. Listen to this. It's more than a potential human being. It's a human being with incredible potential. Made in the image of God. That's what it is. Now I don't know who's going to hear this message. Because it's here and later it will be on radio and it will be on podcasts or however people listen to it, but there might be some mother somewhere that will hear this that has a child in her womb and she's thinking of an abortion. And I would just say, for any woman who has a child and you're thinking about this, go get a sonogram. The reason I say that is a sonogram is this technology where they can effectively take a photograph of the child in the womb and they can do video now as well. And with the new imaging and so forth, you know, you can really see what the child looks like. And studies have found that of those women who were considering abortion and then went and got a sonogram, 90% of them decided against the abortion because it just became real to them. Those are not uterine contents. That is your little baby right there who has every right to live. What about if the mother's life is in danger? It's asked. As though that's supposed to excuse all abortions. Well, the mother's life was in danger. Or she thought it was in danger. Or it could have been in danger. What about that? What about that? Is that an acceptable risk? Let's just say you're a mom, you found out you're pregnant, and the doctor said to you, if you carry this baby to term, there is a possibility you could die giving birth. Oh, then abort it. What? Wait a second. Let me ask you a question. As a mother, if you saw your child running across the street and a car was coming toward your child, would you put your life, your body in the way of the car and push your child out of the path? 
to save them? No. Why not? Well, mother's life was in danger. <laughs> no, the child's life is in danger. The parent lays the life down for the child, not the other way around. Any proper parent would do that. And I might add, they would do it instinctively. They wouldn't have someone to give them a little sermon on it first. It just would be knee jerk, go, save child, you know, do whatever it takes. So what if the mother's life is in danger? Well, how about this? What if they tell you your life is in danger and you have the baby anyway and then you live through it and everything's good? Like what happened with Tim Tebow. You heard of him? Tim's parents were Christian missionaries in the Philippines in 1987 when Pam Tim's mother contracted amoebic dysentery, the leading cause of death in the country. She was pregnant with Tim, her fifth child. At the time, she was very dehydrated and very sick. They did not have access to the best medical care. And a doctor told her to abort the baby. The reason being that the powerful medication she would need for her own problem of amoebic, amoebic dysentery uh, would kill uh, the child. So... Don't do it, he said. Abort the baby. And she decided to carry the baby to term. Her and her husband prayed. And the boy survived. And the mother survived. And uh, they both recognized this was a gift from God. Well, Tim is now a strapping six foot three, 240 pound, two, two, uh, uh, 2007 Heisman Trophy winner, quarterback at the University of Florida. And uh, not only that, but Tim Tebow is a bold witness for Jesus Christ and speaks up for his faith. Didn't he have a right to live? <laughs> now, someone listening to this message might say, well, you know, Greg, you know, it's fine what you're saying, but you've made me very uncomfortable today because I've had an abortion. So what about me? Have I killed an innocent human being? Actually, to be truthful, you have. Yes, you have. Well, what now? What now? You need forgiveness. And the same God that tells you not to do something has made a way for you to be forgiven. He doesn't offer you karma. He offers you forgiveness. And the Bible tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we will confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, God can cleanse any sin. And we can say, well, I've never had an abortion. I've never murdered another person. And we feel pretty good about that. Or I've never committed this other sin you mentioned. Yeah, but wait a second. We've all broken these commandments in some way, shape, or form. Case in point, Jesus takes this commandment we're looking at right now and he refers to it in the Sermon on the Mount and he says, you've heard it, that it has been said, you shall not murder, but I say unto you that if you are angry with your brother without a cause, you will be subject to judgment. Have you ever hated anyone? Have you ever hated anyone so bad you wish they were dead? Oh, no, not me. Let me rephrase the question. Have you ever driven on a freeway in Southern California? <laughs> Come on now, let's be honest. Well, I have a strong dislike for certain people. And if that person were to walk in the room, your blood would just start to boil. Oh, oh, oh. I hate them. Do you? 1 John 3.15 says anyone who hates his brother is really a murderer at heart. You mean it's as bad as murdering? Here's what it is. It's a sin before God. And this is something God says. If you have this attitude, you are committing a sin as well. So we can feel good about not murdering, but have we ever hated anybody? The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.31, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, and all kinds of malicious behavior. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The Bible teaches we are to love, not hate, our enemies. Love them and forgive them. See, we all need God's forgiveness today. It's, I'm not standing here today as some pompous preacher looking down at everyone saying, this is what you ought to do. We're all sinners. We've all broken God's commandments in some way, shape, or form. We all need forgiveness. We all need help. And he offers it graciously and lovingly if we will come to him. And in closing, maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. 
and you don't know what it is to have the hope of eternal life, or maybe you've come in here today loaded down with guilt. Maybe you've had an abortion. Maybe you've literally killed someone. Maybe you have a heart filled with hatred. Maybe you've had another God before him or something else. Whatever it is, you're aware of your sin. But God doesn't make you aware of that sin to drive you away in despair. He makes you aware of that sin so you will run into the open arms of Jesus who says, I love you and I will forgive you. If you'll acknowledge your sin, call it what it was, don't make excuses for it, turn from it and put your faith in me, I will pardon you completely. Because Jesus on the cross shed his blood for you and died for every sin that we have all committed. And he'll give you his complete forgiveness today if you will come to him now. We're going to close in prayer and I'm going to give you an opportunity to get right with God. To come to Christ or if necessary to return to the Lord because you've gone astray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us. It's been a bit uncomfortable at times and hard perhaps for some. But truth is truth. And we believe it and we accept it. And Lord, there might be some that have been made aware of their sin. They feel guilt right now. They feel deep sorrow. But yet scripture tells us that godly sorrow leads to repentance. And I pray that they will find forgiveness in you now. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying. How many of you would say today, Greg, I need forgiveness. I've done something that is a sin before God and I feel guilt. And I want to be forgiven. I want this guilt taken away. I want relief and rest. I'm ready to come to the Lord and follow him. And turn from that sin. Pray for me today if that's your desire. If you want Christ to come into your life. If you want him to forgive you of your sin. If you want to know you'll go to heaven when you die. Or you've fallen away from the Lord. And you want to come back to him again. Would you lift your hand up right now wherever you're sitting. And I'll pray for you today. Just lift up your hand. I'll pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. Down here toward the front. God bless you in the middle. God bless you in the aisle. Anybody else up in the balcony, lift your hand up. I'll pray for you. God bless you. Now listen, there are those of you outside in the amphitheater. I can't see you out there. But I want you to raise your hand up as well. If you need to make this commitment or recommitment to Christ. There are those of you up in the building we call the court with a big screen. I want you to lift your hand up too. Again, I can't see you, but the Lord sees you. Lift your hand up and say, I want Christ right now. Anybody else? If you haven't lifted your hand yet, lift it now. God bless each one. Father, thank you now for each of these. Give them the strength to stand up and follow you and receive your forgiveness, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.